Welcome to Liquid Margins, uh, the Inside Track Hypothesis team members on social annotation. Uh, we're doing something a little different today, this Friday, September 23rd in the year 2022. Um, first of all, we're doing this without my distinguished colleague, Fr Fr Franny French, who usually kicks things off and makes sure the right buttons are pressed on, on the webinar and Zoom and stuff like that. I think I've managed to do that. Looks like closed caption is going, looks like recording is going, looks like people have been able to get in. So I think we're in a good place. Uh, but hats off to Franny for, for usually running liquid margins, but she's on a much needed vacation. Um, the other thing that we're doing really differently today is we normally talk to practitioners of social annotation out there in the world at schools um, that we work with um, to hear their stories about how they're using hypothesis in the classroom. And this uh, liquid margins are sort of taking an internal look um, and having an internal conversation with our own colleagues. Um, but one of the really cool things about Hypothesis is that I think almost every employee uh, at the company kind of blurs the line between being on the sort of vendor side of things uh, or the school side of things. Uh, everybody that we're talking to today has a background and has worked at a college or a high school or a university. Um, and that's true about almost, I think actually everybody at, um, in the, success and sale, in the success and support teams at Hypothesis, which is something I'm very proud of. We've hired a lot of former educators. <laughs> um, and I think that's, uh, that's been awesome for building out a really great team. Um, but it also enables us to really speak authentically with the folks that we're working with uh, and collaborate deeply. Um, so you'll get to meet some of those folks today. Um, I also think it's important to, uh, to see the people behind the technology. <laughs> Right, uh, a lot of us use tools, and we might forget that uh, you know human beings built those tools. Um, just as sometimes the people, the human beings that are building tools, forget there's human beings on the other side. So these are the human human beings of hypothesis uh, today that we're going to be sharing, and I'm I'm excited to have that that conversation. Um, finally, I'm really excited to be able to showcase some of the awesome people that I get to work with at Hypothesis. I'm really thrilled about my teammates as part of what keeps me at Hypothesis. And it's not a bad advertisement for potential customers of Hypothesis to be like, these are the awesome people you get to work with. Um, they have really interesting backgrounds and they have really interesting things to say. So that's what we're here to do. The Inside Track Hypothesis team members on social annotation. Again, my name is, I don't think I introduced myself, so I'll reintroduce I'll introduce myself as I'm Jeremy Deed, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. Uh, I am a former educator, uh, high school English teacher, um, English uh, grad student and, and instructor at the college level, um, practitioner of social annotation in the classroom before going to work for a social annotation tool called Genius and then coming to Hypothesis. So I share some of my journey here because it has a kindred uh, track to those that are here. And I'll introduce them and then we'll jump into the conversation. So I'm here with Christy DeCarolis, who's a customer success manager at Hypothesis, maybe a month into the job or so, something like that. Um, one of the great, well, I'm not, I'm not going to steal her thunder, actually. I was about to tell her story for her. I'm not going to do that. Um, but she has worked at Rutgers, uh, and she's also, I believe, taught high school history. Is that right, Christy? Yep, that Are is you, true. You okay. So Christy's here with us today, and then there's Chris Diaz, uh, who's a customer support engineer at Hypothesis, just a couple weeks in on the job. Um, and uh, he comes to us from Northwestern, uh, where he was... Um, where he was a librarian. And then Suzanne Miller, uh, who is also a customer success manager, is with us today. And uh, she has worked in customer success at, at other companies, but she also taught high school English. Um, I have a sweet spot for high school English teachers because I was one myself. I think we have a few on staff. And anytime I see that on a resume, I'm like, oh yeah, we should definitely move that one along. And this one, we moved along um, all the way to uh, hiring her. And she's uh, with us today for this conversation. So um, I'm gonna try to shut myself up and jump in to hear more about you guys. And so going in this order, I'd love for each of you just to share a little bit about your career journey. Um, I know none of you started in ed tech and here we are, I guess, in ed tech. We, might, we could question whether we're in ed tech, but I think on, from some perspective, we're all in ed tech on the industry side right now. Um, none of you started there. How did you get here? Christy. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna try and make this a brief story. So I did start my career as a high school history teacher. Um, and when I started 
I taught at a Title I school and I just felt like after my first year, I wasn't really making the deep connections with my students that I wanted to be. Um, so I spent that summer really trying to dive into ed tech on Twitter and um, I started a blog. Like I was like really into trying to um, find different tech tools to uh, get my students more engaged with learning. And um, from there, I decided to do my master's degree in instructional technology. And that led me to transition into instructional design. Um, and I was at uh, Rutgers for about eight years um, as staff there uh, in the instructional design and technology office, supporting faculty and teaching online and trying to better engage students that way. So I still kind of saw this thread going along in my career of, I just want to help people engage students, whether it's my students, whether it's, you know, faculty at Rutgers Camden trying to engage their students. And um, it was there that I also started teaching online. And I believe that um, maybe it was in 2018, that I had heard of Hypothesis and um, started using it in my own courses at Rutgers Camden. Um, so I was super pumped about how it went in my classes. And when I saw that there was a customer success manager position here at Hypothesis, I was like, wow, that's a cool opportunity because it became one of my favorite ed tech tools to support because I felt like it was so easy to use and my students, it was one of like the most successful tools that I was using in my class. So here I am. That's the the short version of my story, I guess. It's awesome. We'll, we'll, we'll get into other details. I will just say I've been on a couple of workshops with Christy when she's presenting to a school and it, it gave me goosebumps the first time when she sort of introduced herself and she's like, I used to be an instructional designer at a school that works with hypothesis. And now I'm working as customer success manager with you, instructional designers and uh, teachers at, uh, that are using hypothesis. So that's awesome. Uh, I think you're next, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so I, before coming to a hypothesis, I worked as an academic librarian for about 10 years at uh, different schools around the Midwest. Um, and through that journey, I worked in a variety of different aspects of the library, reference, instruction, collection development, uh, scholarly communications, open education. Um, and sort of the, the main like thread that has stayed with me throughout my entire academic uh, librarian career was focused around the use and promotion and support for open content. Um, I, my first job um, as a librarian was focused on promoting open access publishing to faculty, um, educating people about copyright and different experimental uh, ways to facilitate peer review. And that's actually where I heard about Hypothesis to begin with was from the scholarly publishing peer review side of things. Um, I remember uh, when I started at, uh, at the University of Iowa in like around 2013, there was kind of a lot of uh, excitement around the idea of both uh, open peer review and post-publication peer review. And Hypothesis was one of the early tools available to sort of facilitate that sort of discussion around uh, preprints or uh, publications on, on websites. Um, and so I've always like known about Hypothesis, but I think what kind of brought me out of libraries and into educational technology proper was my uh, love for and interest in open source software. So um, I, got really excited when I saw this support engineer position at Hypothesis. I thought it would be uh, a really great way to learn more about the technical side of educational technology. Uh, I really love that the organization is committed to open standards and open source software. Um, and it was a good opportunity for me to kind of leverage my experience working with and supporting educators um, in the library. So, so now I get to work with, uh, um, 
users of Hypothesis at colleges and schools around the country and around the world. And I get to see a different side of the uh, sort of educational enterprise uh, from my vantage point, which is really interesting. So uh, that's kind of where, where my background is and what, what brought me here. That's awesome, Chris. I just have to share one anecdote, which is when we interviewed you for the job. I remember side, side, uh, side chatting, chatting with Dan, the founder of Hypothesis, and we're like, okay, yeah, this guy could definitely do the customer support engineer job. But on top of that, he just sort of so clearly shares a DNA with where Hypothesis comes from, um, especially in terms of that commitment to openness and and, and code and and content. Um, so really glad you're here. All right, Suzanne. How'd you get here? <laughs> How did I get here? Um, well, I started my career, as, as Jeremy mentioned, teaching English, teaching high school English. Um, actually kind of bookended my, my 24 career, 24 year career in um, uh, public education, both in Florida and now um, here in North Carolina. And so uh, played a few other roles in between, um, but uh, my my last uh, my last few years were teaching high school English before uh, I came to the other side of the table, um, mainly uh, as a customer success manager, but mainly because um, I was a huge believer in engaging uh, with digital content with my students, having them think critically uh, through what they were reading. And so, uh, I found my, myself embracing multiple tools that did just that. Um, and so um, this kind of answers that question that's probably going to come later about my commitment to hypothesis, um, but it very much aligns um, with that, you know, I guess philosophy that, uh, you know, that digital tools, ed tech, um, K-12, higher education, that uh, you want students and teachers taking more of an active part um, in the education, not so much um, being passive um, in, in that process. And so Hypothesis stands out in that area, as well as the other um, tools that I've supported over the years. You can name them. It's okay. <laughs> We're not, this isn't a, you know. Uh, <laughs> And the other great thing, of course, is that you came, you're, you're part of the family because Michael, our uh, customer support engineer, uh, was working at Actively Learn when you were a customer of Actively Learn and recruited you to Actively Learn <laughs> uh, because you were such a great advocate of, of the, for the tool and for the, not just the tool, but the pedagogy surrounding the tool. Um, and uh, then he came here and then uh, you followed him here a few uh, years later and we're very, very happy for it. So I think we are, you guys bled a little, this is the problem with sharing the questions beforehand so people start to cheat and start to answer the second question, which is uh, I believe what Suzanne and, uh, and Chris have done. I mean, Chris, your through line for you is openness, right? In terms of your career. My next question was, what's the through line in that journey, right? I've switched careers like you guys have, um, but I feel like there's a consistency across teaching um, and working in technology for me. Uh, Chris's was openness. Um, you can elaborate if you want. Suzanne's, yours was engagement, would you say, or active, active learning, right? It's kind of a through line yeah. for you. And, yeah. and critical thinking. In that. Active learning and critical thinking, that's great. And I think mine is probably engagement, just I was always trying to get students engaged. Um, and now I'm still trying to get students engaged and keep students engaged, but, you know, from the trying to the tool side of it. Chrissy, did you get to talk a little bit about the through line of your career yet? Yeah, I definitely jumped ahead on that and I stole okay. engage, I stole your engagement no okay. I, right. because right. that is really what I was trying to do um when I was teaching high school and um in supporting faculty and then teaching college classes as well it's just figuring out way how, ways to keep students engaged and make them um to bounce off of Suzanne active uh participants in the classroom yeah, and I think for me, there's also like one step further, which I think you guys are saying too, which is getting getting folks excited. I mean, I was a nerd and, and, and throughout my academic career, I, I loved learning. Um, I got excited about it. And I think when I became an educator, that was sort of one of the things you know, to, be, to be engaged, to be active, but also just to be excited, to be passionate about it. Um, something that's a through line for me. Um, 
So I also think you guys may have jumped ahead on this one, but let's go backwards a little bit and just hear about, you know, with Suzanne first this time, when did you first come across the, the idea of social orientation? It doesn't have to be in the hypothesis context, but it could be hypothesis itself. Tell us a little bit about that origin story of first encountering this type of technology. Um, I would say, uh, as I was um, exploring, not through the digital <laughs> arena, but through just uh, best practice in learning and education, obviously close reading became a huge thing, um, you know, sort of midway through my career. And so I embraced a lot of uh, close reading practices. I kind of uh, considered myself on the cutting edge of <laughs> what those practices would be. And the idea that, you know, a digital tool could sort of simplify that, um, you know, in my mind, make it more efficient <laughs> um, was something that I completely embraced um, when I discovered the first few tools uh, that I used, including Actively Learn um, with, with social annotation. So, uh, you know, and I think it very much mirrored the, you know, the increase in the use of social media and some other stuff. And I think that that, um, kind of dovetailed nicely <laughs> with my my classroom practice, which was nice. Yeah, I'll just briefly share my, I, I had a very similar story, right? I'd always been talking about annotation to students, encouraging annotation, you know, in, in analog formats. And I started to explore digital technologies and try to bring them into the classroom, you know, to be a hip teacher or whatever, right? A lot of stuff I used, or a lot of stuff I saw colleagues using, I was like, I don't know if this is really working. When I first started getting introduced and interested in using digital tools in the classroom, people were using this platform called Second Life, which is sort of like a you know alternate world or something like that. Where people have avatars and they're trying to teach composition, you know, through Second Life. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know if I can get into this. And then I saw social annotation tool, and I was like, that makes sense to me, right? That is a, a, a skill and practice that is not particularly new. So you know, been around for a while. I've been practicing it personally, encouraging my students to, but. This is a new context, maybe makes it more efficient, and, you know, makes it more multimedia. I'm not a drawer or an illustrator, right? So but with bringing in images into, you know, annotations, I suddenly can, you know, do, do more in my annotations than I can in an analog context. So um, yeah, very similar pathway to you. Uh, Chris, social annotation. I know we were just talking the other day about, you know, social annotation and scholarly publishing. I don't know, you know, when you first came across this concept that would be interested to hear. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it first came, I first learned about it uh, around sort of disrupting the double blind peer review process and kind of making it more of a, an open conversation, trying to um, tie into other elements and like movements in open science and replication and open sharing of data, trying to just open up the conversation a bit more uh, in like a scholarly publishing context. Um, but, uh, you know, so that was early in my career. Uh, more recently at Northwestern, um, I was uh, really involved in the design and launch of an open educational resources program. And so that brought me uh, into a lot of conversations around how to uh, sort of leverage these web publications, these open publications with other sorts of learning tools. And I remember um, a couple of years ago, I think I, I was like on the other side of like a presentation that Jeremy gave at Northwestern about demoing uh, hypothesis. And, and it was like, I was brought into that conversation because there was a lot of uh, potential there for um, connecting our OER authors and OER users on campus with hypothesis and they're also kind of played in with uh, sort of moved movement towards like flipped classrooms and asynchronous communication and obviously with the, the pandemic and online learning um, it just seemed to make a lot of sense for for people to start using that at Northwestern um, more, more recently so um, so yeah it was kind of top of mind towards the later parts of my time at Northwestern um, mostly from like an educational perspective rather than uh, scholarly publishing. Cool. I think I want to hear from Christy and then maybe pause and try to connect some dots here between, you know, Chris's background is pretty different from Suzanne and Christy's, right? Uh, 
not a classroom educator, but working at an academic institution, thinking a lot about publishing. And this has, of course, always been part of the history of hypothesis, as we've always had some interest in getting involved in scholarly publishing um, and peer review and things like that, but uh, also this classroom interest. So I'd like to circle back with everybody to talk about, can we connect those two things? But Christy, you talked a little bit about your origin story with hypothesis, but rehash it a little bit for us, how you first you know, discovered social annotation. So I want to say, and I might be remembering wrong, that maybe I did like Digo or Delicious, one of those social bookmarking tools also have annotation capabilities. I feel like I was exploring those. Um, I wanted to, even further than just engage my students more, something that was has always been important to me is to um, have my students act as contributors to course content. So I've never wanted to necessarily be the only like source of knowledge or the only source of authority um, in my classes. And I feel like social annotation is a great opportunity for students to, you know, contribute either their knowledge from other courses, their own life experiences, or their own like research on the spot. Um, and it kind of started with, I don't think I actually used like the social annotation features in whatever it was, this Digo or Delicious, whatever those social bookmarking tools were, um, but even just like collecting websites together. Um, and then when I did see hypothesis, I was like, wait, there, I've seen something like this before. This could be a really easy way for us to kind of collaborate um, and create knowledge together as a class. I think that, that starts to help to make the connection, right? Between, I mean, Chris, do you, do you see a connection there between opening up scholarly production <laughs> uh, to be more horizontal um, with the sort of classroom horizontality of decentering the teacher that Christy's talking about? Wait, did you say Christy or Chris? I was, <laughs> I said both, I think. Okay. Chris, do you see a kinship in terms of the scholarly production, you know, democratization, scholarly production with the democratization of the classroom that Christy's talking about? Yeah, yeah. Because because like I like I said, a lot of, of the earlier criticisms of the double blind peer review process was that it's only kind of two voices mm -hmm. giving feedback and kind of being the gatekeepers of this mm -hmm. um uh what gets published and what is actually considered. Uh, you know, a valuable contribution to the discourse of whatever academic discipline we're talking about. Um, and so the idea of open peer review and open um, sort of post-publication peer review facilitated by tools like an, an, uh, Hypothesis um, would help bring in more voices that could also be, um, you know, valuable, uh, something that the, the two peer reviewers wouldn't have thought of. You know, there's a lot more ideas that could be um fostered within that does this resonate at all for you suzanne either in your when you were teaching and thinking about democratizing your classroom or supporting student voice or the ways that you saw actively learn kind of help democratize and and raise student voice um a little different i think in high schools <laughs> um but i, I I mean, I, I will say I, throughout my entire career, I moved more towards a student-centered approach and giving my students more voice and choice. Um, so obviously social annotation aligned beautifully with that goal um, that I had set for myself. But you also talked about uh, visibility. We were riffing before the recording started and you were talking about, I forget exactly how you said, it, make, making thinking visible or something like that. Um, Talk a little bit about the importance reveal of- Reveal thinking, was it that? Reveal or? thinking, yeah. Talk to me about revealing thinking and then maybe we can go back and, and think about that. Um, transparency, right? Openness, mm -hmm. uh, democracy, transparency. These are some of the values at the core of hypothesis that we see starting to infiltrate um, scholarly publishing practices as well as uh, pedagogical practices in the classroom. So re revealing thinking? Yeah, so the idea of um, again, <laughs> moving more towards the formal 
to the informal assessments um, throughout my career. So I found myself relying more on formative um, assessment techniques as I, um, you know, as I moved through my career. The idea uh, that students needed regular ongoing feedback, you know, in the moment. Um, I always say that my students' writing um, improved so much better um, through the tools I was using, like actively um, at the time, because of that feedback, that constant communication that was happening. Um, and some of it was obviously not just my feedback, it was feedback from peers. Uh, so, you know, I, all I can say is that it, 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 again, gave them more of a voice. It allowed them to give each other feedback. It allowed me to give feedback better. And it just, like, I keep coming back to the idea, it just made it all so much more efficient to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think, I don't know if this was purposeful, but you elegant, elegant, elegantly answered a question in the chat from Manny Fernandez around uh, improving student writing through social annotation practices. So you actually just touched on that. I know if that was intentional, but um, Christy's also doing double duty here, being on camera and answering in the chat and then responded to Manny. But um, I think that's what we're talking about, Manny, right? Is that student writing improves, um, I don't wanna say almost naturally um, in the context of social annotation because the student is pre-writing ahead of an assignment. So there's some work that's going on before, but also feedback that Suzanne is talking about um, peers being able to comment on that writing, push on certain ideas, ask for clarity, it's going to improve that writing. Uh, and then of course the instructors there as well. And Chris, I think you were basically suggesting this, that the ecosystem of scholarly knowledge production is going to benefit from this kind of transparency and more voices. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's happening in other elements of, um, sort of scholarship, um, we're seeing it with uh, an increase in reproducible research, an increase in funding for replication studies. It's all about um, bringing in more uh, sort of, I, I like the idea of like making it more horizontal <laughs> and top down in terms of the way that knowledge flows uh, through uh, communities. Chris, anything to share about this idea of transparency and making reading visible as we talk about it uh, from your teaching experience or supporting the tool? Um, I think I put something in the chat about this, but just um, from my own classes, I found that um, it's easier for me to identify where student confusions are um, before they hit unit projects through the social annotations. Um, and I have a ton of formative assessments in my class, like every week students are handing in some kind of like reading reflection or um, like something like that. But sometimes those aren't targeted towards, you know, everything that the reading is hitting. So social annotation kind of gives the students a more open ended way to address the reading uh, and really helps me hone in on you know, where is their interest? Where is their um, confusions? Uh, what do I need to address before, you know, we're moving on to the projects and things like that? Thanks, Christy. Apologies, guys, my, my earbuds died. So I've had to relocate to a phone booth at my co-working space. Um, that's the change of scenery here. Um, awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you guys, you know, uh, first discovered this job opportunity to come work here and what really excited you most about when you saw that opportunity and you, and you went after it. What were you excited about in terms of coming to Hypothesis? And start with you, Christy. I know we've touched on this a little bit, but when we chop this up for distribution, it'll all seem uh, <laughs> more natural. So I think that, okay. So like I said, I was at Rutgers and I was at Rutgers in 2018 um, when I started using Hypothesis and I think at that point I connected with Jeremy back then to start to start using Hypothesis at Rutgers. So I believe that Jeremy, Jeremy and I were connected on LinkedIn and possibly I saw the position that way. So like maybe Jeremy shared it and I was just kind of scrolling along as we do and um, 
you know, happened upon the customer success manager position. And it really like I it sounds almost like fake to me, like how much I was like, oh, this is a tool that I actually like really love supporting as um an instructional designer. You know, we did a lot of uh, ed tech, like technical support as instructional designers. Um, it was one of the easiest tools to support, which is, you know, never a bad thing. Um, and I just saw how it worked with faculty. And I know that I loved using it in my own courses and my students had really positive feedback about it. Um, so when I saw that, it was just like, here's a great opportunity to, you know, work spreading a tool that has really positively impacted my own teaching. And that just seemed like a really cool opportunity. It doesn't come along that often. Um, so that is what led me to apply. And it's it, again, like, it just sounds like, how could I be that like corny about it? But it's true. <laughs> uh, I bet when you read that job description, you were like, yep, yep. Can do that. Can do that. Can do that. That is me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to do it a different order this time. Suzanne, uh, I know you sort of heard about it through Michael, but tell me about what excited you about coming to Hypothesis. Well, you're going to have to <laughs> bear with me. I'm trying to answer Sarah in the chat. <laughs> I don't know. Are we able to go off script a little bit to address Sarah? Sure. Before she heads. Yeah. <laughs> go for it. Um, I Always just... attentive to the users. I know. <laughs> Well, it just she was talking about bridging that gap between how I guess vocal her students were in um, annotating online and then bridging that to in class discussion. And what I was going to share I was in the process of typing actually uh, was the the idea that I always tried to incentivize my students with payoffs for doing high quality annotation, um, and so. Uh, oftentimes the play, the payoffs were we would have Socratic seminars, um, debates in class, uh, you know, over obviously important questions, essential questions, if you will. Um, and so, you know, I think it had a lot to do with the text selection, obviously, showing lots of different um, opinions and perspectives in what students were writing or reading. And then um, telling them that they could use those uh, to reference during those in-class discussions that were a little more formalized. You know what I mean? The idea of like a Socratic seminar is a little more formal than just a small group discussion, um, or having you know having a class debate. You know where there were certain sides. I, I used to always say that. I wouldn't tell my students which side they were going to be on. So they had to be prepared for all of them. Um, and so, I don't know, that's just, to me, they saw a, a really deep connection to being prepared, having those high quality annotations and using them for those in-class, like, like I said, sort of formal discussion um, opportunities. So I don't know if that answers Sarah, <laughs> but I wanted to do that before she had. It certainly to was a valiant attempt. I think she may have signed off. Uh, oh, she make, did. Okay. Make sure that we will connect with Sarah about those questions. Um, not particularly the topic of this episode. Yeah. Um, we have lots of different programming and uh, certainly lots of people in house that can speak to uh, what do you do after the students have annotated. Um, so yeah. somebody will reach out to Sarah and continue that conversation. And yeah. maybe we can have a look at margins episode about that. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about how I came to Hypothesis too. <laughs> sure, all right, you keep us on track, yeah, thanks. Yes, um, you, you, you mentioned, you kind of gave the story of talking about Michael and works in support. Um, I've had a connection with him for the last, I would say five or six, maybe more years. Um, and he's the first person that kind of encouraged me to take the leap into ed tech. And obviously we've stayed in touch and that's how I sort of, I found my way here to Hypothesis. And the idea is that Hypothesis, like I said, very much aligns with my educational philosophy uh, about having or making, making it so students can engage and think critically through their reading and have a little more voice and choice. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, it it sort of was a perfect marriage of you know my past experience um, 
to today. It's awesome. Chris, we may have recovered, we may have covered this already. Do you feel like you've covered your, how, you know, what excited you about coming here? Uh, yeah, I can, I can elaborate a little bit more. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I worked as a librarian for 10 years and basically having moved around the, the library in different departments, um, sort of the, there wasn't a lot of like, the only place to move uh, if I stayed in libraries was to go into like management and I wasn't really interested. <laughs> I don't think I'm like a good people manager. I just really wanted to like work on projects and learn more. Uh, at the time I really wanted and still do really want to just focus on this new sort of path focusing on technology. And so uh, I thought that this would be the perfect role for getting sort of feeling like I'm at the, the start of a whole new learning path of uh, you know, te technical support, but also uh, software development, um, infrastructure operations, uh, security, uh, privacy, um, you know, a, a whole bunch of things that would just be completely new. So that was really exciting to me. Um, and, uh, you know, what really sealed the deal was was the, the organization itself, I think is kind of fascinating because um, as I was learning about open source software for the last three, three plus years, a big question in the open source software world is how do you sustain an open source project? Um, and I really, I really like that hypothesis um, has found sort of a business model that can be, that can help sustain an open source product in the long run while also, you know, contributing back to uh, the global open source community um, and then contributing to open standards. Um, so I really like the uh, sort of commitment to openness while also having sort of a, a business model that, that can be uh, sustained over the long run. Because uh, having come from academia, I know that um, it can be precarious to you know, rely too much on grants or on charitable donations. So I really like the idea of sustaining open source through a sustainable business model. So that was also really interesting to me. It wasn't easy. <laughs> it took a while yeah. to figure it out. Um, all right, I want to get a soundbite in um, for posterity here. I'm going to ask each of your questions off script, but I think you should be able to answer it. Uh, what does social annotation mean to you? I want to know employees of hypothesis. What does social annotation meaning to you, mean to you? Starting with you, Christine. Oh man, I get to go first. Okay. Well, I think I kind of already answered this. Um, social annotation to me is a collective way of constructing knowledge. So um, we are all reading a text together, but we all come from different places and we all have something different to contribute and have different perspectives and you know various ways to reflect on it. So that is how I would define it. Christy as former librarian, current <laughs> support engineer at Hypothesis. What does yeah, social education mean to you? I don't have the best the answer to this, but I like the idea of um, adding depth to, to text. Um, I like the idea of like adding different layers, you know, that social annotation can bring. So you have like the sort of the source that you're working from, but then you have a conversation layer on top of that, and then you have replies, and then you have tags, and it's just like, it just creates a different sort of depth, depth perception that uh, wouldn't really exist um, in any other context that I'm familiar with. So I think that there's a lot of potential and opportunity there that uh, is exciting. Ironically, I feel like you answered that question like an English teacher would. Um, so I appreciate that. That definitely resonates with me. All right, Suzanne Miller, former high school English teacher, current customer success uh, yeah. manager at Hypothesis. What does social annotation mean to you? Um, well, I feel like Christy and Chris kind of covered <laughs> covered my, uh, my answer here, but uh, yeah, the, the idea that, um, you know, students that didn't typically engage in in in-person discussion, um, you know, the shy ones, which I can definitely say I was when I was in school, <laughs> um, it, empowering them to feel like they can contribute and contribute thoughtfully, um, you know, to to a text-based discussion uh, was really powerful for me. Um, 
And I would say it probably is, it still is <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. I definitely had an aha, aha moment like that when I was teaching with Genius uh, in a classroom where I had a student that was not doing well uh, and, and not succeeding in the normal ways that I'd set up to evaluate my students. Um, and when I started doing social annotation, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I already knew that there was a lot more depth to the text. Um, and it's not that I didn't know that there was more depth to her, but I hadn't given her proper place to share it or showcase it. And suddenly I saw all this depth uh, come out of her um, in, in in annotation that was uh, pretty awesome. Um, and it was a struggling student that turned it around, you know, in, in the margins of the text, as it were. Um, all right, we're going to conclude with one final question. Um, what excites you about the future, about education, about social annotation, about ed tech, about hypothesis? What's most exciting to you about the future? Going to go in reverse order, Suzanne. What are you most excited about in the future, for the future? Um, well, I'm. as far as hypothesis, I obviously think that there's um, so much more to explore. Um, uh, the idea of, you know, continuously evolving <laughs> um, to, to sort of meet the, meet the needs of educators and students, um, you know, that's, that's huge for me, um, always feeling like you're on the cutting edge. Um, and just in ed tech, I think something that excites me um, a great deal is the idea of, you um, platforms and programs and tools like, like Hypothesis uh, becoming better because of the feedback and input from educators. I love that. And I think you'll find that at Hypothesis, that feedback loop is pretty tight. <laughs> we listen to our users, students, teachers, administrators, uh, and really bring that feedback directly to our product and engineering teams. And as a success manager and as a support engineer, you're going to be a conduit for that. So you're in a good place to hear that feedback. Chris, what is the future? Uh, two things. Um, it's really exciting to see a lot of new partners signing on to use uh, Hypothesis. So the company is, is growing and expanding its uh, user base, which is uh, great. But and there's also been um, a lot of uh, interesting new integrations with things like JSTOR and Vital Source. That's really exciting. Um, more longer term, um, you know, I, I am familiar with some some movement uh, in the web browser community to add uh, native um, annotation capabilities, sort of built into to Chromium, which is what a lot of web browsers are based on now. And so I think that there's a lot of potential to uh, see this sort of get formal support in sort of the web browser standards and, and uh, technologies. So I think that there, there's a lot of uh, exciting potential there that 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 is uh, forthcoming. Christy. Well, I definitely echo everything that Suzanne and Chris said, because those are all super exciting things. Um, I'm just excited to see more faculty react and learn how hypothesis can you know change their classroom without necessarily having to do a lot in in the in the way they um approach teaching they don't have to change too much in that you're, you're giving readings already and here's a different way that we can do these readings together um and kind of trying to democratize that process a little bit more and make it less of a you know isolating process and more of a collaborative process um and just i've you know worked with a lot of faculty that it's really exciting when you know they do it for the first time and um it just seems to work really well and you know they get excited about what the students are saying in in the annotations so i'm just excited to keep working with people and seeing that light bulb go off i love it um, I had a light bulb go off as you guys were giving your answers, so I'm going to answer my own question about what excites me about the future. And it's a, it's a combination of y'all's backgrounds and your passions and your skills that you brought to the table here. Um, it's the fact that like Suzanne and Christy, I've had experiences in the classroom with this type of technology that have been incredibly um, empowering to me as an instructor, and I've seen it be empowering for students, uh, democratizing 
activating learners. Um, and what Chris is tying into is kind of the, the bigger picture here, right? The way that this technology uh, is useful in other industries and in other professions and in everyday life on the web. And it's that connection between the work we do as English teachers, Suzanne, and as history teachers, Christy, that we're always passionate. We want students to be thinking critically about text and thinking deeply and close reading and, and collaborating. And the idea that that could jump out of the classroom and be part of how people start to interact and behave um, and relate to each other in everyday life on the internet, in other industries and professions, but also just in how they engage with the information and writing that's online. Um, this idea that it's a tool for teaching and learning that you can adopt for a classroom, <laughs> um, but it's something that goes beyond the classroom ultimately. Um, and I feel like those of us that were drawn to education always wanted to believe or thought we were doing that work that was gonna, we're not training people to take tests or write papers exactly. All of those things are a means to a greater end that's supposed to help society. And one of the cool things is about hypothesis is that it's it's actually doing that. <laughs> it's not as a, uh, uh, it's not a disposable tool like many of the things one might use um, in education. It's something that you can use beyond the classroom and its its skills are useful beyond the classroom. So that's what excites me about the future, that uh, the work we're doing with students and teachers in the classroom is something that's ultimately going to transcend that um, and uh, empower folks, everyday folks on the internet. So thank you all so much for this morning's conversation or afternoon for those of you guys on the East Coast um, or evening for those in farther flung places that might be tuning in. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, I get to talk to these folks every day, so it's going to keep going for me. Um, if you're already working with Hypothesis uh, as a partner, you might have the opportunity to interact with Chris and Suzanne and Christy. If you're not yet working with Hypothesis, what could be more compelling than hearing about what kind of awesome people we have on staff here that are working directly with uh, teachers and students and administrators at schools? Um, let us know if you'd like to get a pilot started at your school. And with that, I will say, have a great rest of your Friday and a wonderful weekend and go forth and annotate.